So in this last formal lecture of Module 10, I want to focus on a fascinating theory that rationalizes some of the solution behavior we've seen. I will tell you to hold tight because there's a lot of derivation in this lecture, but uh, we do get to an end point that I think is quite beautiful and illuminating. So let me adopt a molecular model in order to explain non-ideal solutions. And so first, I'm going to assume my molecules are randomly mixed. So the entropy of mixing is just the ideal entropy of mixing, right? That's part of being a regular solution. So any excess Gibbs free energy of mixing is associated with an enthalpy change. And enthalpies and liquids, there's no real PV component per se here that's associated with energies. So there's a potential energy of interaction that's, that's making a difference here. So let me define the potential energy in my solution. And the total energy of the solution is N11 times epsilon 11, where what, what does N11 mean? It's how many interactions are there between two different molecules one. And the number of those interactions is multiplied times some energy of interaction. So that's all the energy associated with two molecules one interacting with each other. And then there's also an N22, E22 term, epsilon, I suppose. Um, and that's the energy associated with two molecules, two interacting with each other, times how many of those interactions there are. And finally, there's a cross term, N12, epsilon 12. So how many 12 interactions are there, and what's their energy? We're going to assume that interactions only happen between nearest neighbors. Right? So these are molecules that are touching one another. And just to make life a little easier, let's assume all molecules are perfect spheres in two dimensions. So suddenly we're doing physics, I guess. But um, it's going to make it more convenient for our derivation. So here I have molecule 1 are green molecules, molecule 2 purple molecules, I suppose. And again, to make life reasonably convenient, they're about the same size. So it turns out that then I have a coordination number. Z, I'll call the coordination number, that tells me exactly how many contacts I have about any given molecule. And I will, uh, it's six in this particular example. So that's helpful. <clears throat> it tells me that the total number of type 1 neighbors for a given molecule is Z, how many molecules are there around it, six times, whatever the mole fraction of one is in the solution. All right, uh, that's, that's how many neighbors there are. So here I am, I'm number one. If the mole fraction in the solution were, it looks like it's about uh, six parts out of seven here, I'd expect to find about five out of six of my neighbors would be one. All right? And as these numbers get big, you don't have to worry about the fact that we only had seven. So what's the total number of 1-1 one, one pairs? Well, it's coordination number times the mole fraction times how many molecules 1 are there in the first place. I need to know, you know, fraction of what. And then I have to divide by 2 because otherwise I'll double count, right? When I, when I sit on one molecule 1 and I say, oh yeah, look, I've got this neighbor over here. That's a 1-1 one, one pair. Well, eventually I'm going to sit on this molecule and say, oh, look at that. There's a 1-1 one, one pair over there. So I just have to divide by 2. I don't have that problem when I compute 1-2 pairs. So if they're n1 times z times x1 uh, uh, nearest neighbors that are 1-1, one, one, the nearest neighbors that are 2 for each molecule 1 is the mole fraction of 2. Okay, so n1, z, x2, and obviously that works the other way around by the definition of the mole fraction and the number of molecules, those are proportional. So I can also have N2ZX1. So let me rewrite then my potential energy. So I'm going to insert for N11. I've now figured out, based on coordination number and mole fraction, what is N11. And now I'm going to take the definition of mole fraction, which is the number of whatever one I'm interested in divided by the total number of the two molecules. And I will insert that in for mole fraction. So here I get an N1 squared. 
Here I get an N1, N2, and so forth. <coughs> and to make life a little bit simpler, I'm going to define a new variable. I'm going to find W. So W is twice the interaction energy between two unlike partners minus the interaction energy between one pair of like and the interaction energy between the other pair of like. And there's a little nifty algebra that I'm not going to waste a lot of slides on, but if I make that substitution, plugging in for epsilon 1, 2, what I would get by rearranging this equation, then I will find that I can write my total energy in the following way. It's coordination number E11, N1 over 2, coordination number E22, N2 over 2, plus Z times WN1, N2 over 2, N1 plus N2. I, I, I leave the proof for the interested algebraic reader. So in an ideal solution, all molecular interaction energies would be equal. Right? And in that case, W would be zero. This last term goes away in an ideal solution. And it basically says you'd have a way to compute all the interaction energies because in an ideal solution, the molecules can't really tell their different molecules, right? They have similar interactions with one another. But if we zoom in a bit on this non-ideality, so I can write my free energy in solution as the ideal free energy plus this extra term, this extra interaction energy term. And now I'm going to take advantage of n sub i over Avogadro's number is equal to the number of moles. So I'll just make that substitution everywhere. And that leaves me one factor of Avogadro's number, because here I've got a product and here I've got just a sum. Here are the individual moles. And the reason I want to do that is I want to think about the chemical potential. So the chemical potential of component one is the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to that component. And I know, given that this is my free energy, it's the partial derivative of the ideal solution with respect to component one, plus the partial derivative of this term, that's the non-ideal term, and it's a term that involves number of moles of one. So I, I can take that partial derivative, that's not too hard. So I'll just move that to the next slide to, to keep that going. Um, here I'll actually do a little bit of differential calculus. So when I take the partial derivative of this quotient, so this is f over g, so here's f prime g minus g prime f all over g squared would be a way to think of that. That's the usual uh, rule for differentiation of a quotient. And then I will move out a factor of n2 over n1 plus n2 in front. So when I pull that out, I am left with 1 here and I am left with n1 over n1 plus n2 here. But n1 over n1 plus n2, well, that's x1. And n2 over n1 plus n2, well, that's x2. And moreover, 1 minus x1 is x2. So that's just x2 squared. So that's a nice, clean simplification. So that means my chemical potential is equal to the ideal chemical potential, mu1 star plus RT log mole fraction, plus this last term. So these were the constants I pulled out before I did the differentiation. Here they are, ZW, Avogadro's number two, times X2 squared. Let me define yet another variable. I did tell you to hold on at the beginning of this lecture. All right, let that variable be just these constants, just to make life a little bit easier. So Z, W, Avogadro's number, 2. I mean, captured in there is all the information about how many neighbors do my molecules have, how different are the interactions between unlike molecules compared to like molecules. I'm just going to bury that all in one, one variable, U. When I do that, I arrive at the chemical potential is mu1 star, that's still there, RT log X1, that's still there, but I want to just write this as a single logarithm. So this became UX2 squared. Well, let me write that as log EUX2 squared. 
And in which case, I can embed within this the uh, e to the u x2 squared divided by rt and uh, have a single simple expression. And that, that's the activity. So that's, that's how we express non-ideal solutions to look like ideal solutions. We have in place of x sub 1, we've got something else. And a is the activity is expressed this way. So what are the effects of non-ideality? Well, activity, remember, what is it? It's P1 over P1 star. So if the activity is x1 e to the ux2 squared over rt, I can actually take a look as a function of u. What does this look like? So here's mole fraction. And here plotted for different values of u. So I'm going to plug in 1 or 0 or negative 1. And I'm going to look at what's p1 over p1 star. That is, what is the activity? So I'm just plotting this function. So mole fraction I'm varying. And I know x2 is 1 minus x1, so I can plot that as well. And of course, if I have u equal to 0, so if you work back what is u, you discover the only way really to get u equal to 0 is to have w equal to 0. And remember, w equal to 0 was an ideal solution. And moreover, if I look at this, e to the 0 is 1. So I'd have activity equal to mole fraction. That's an ideal solution when the activity is equal to the mole fraction. So here's the ideal solution. Positive deviation from Raoul's law behavior. That's where p1 is greater than, than expected. Sorry, that's where the vapor pressure is greater than expected compared to Raoul's law, which is here. That implies, uh, and sorry, that is a positive u. And again, looking at how u is defined, that means that the energy of interaction between unlike partners is not as good as it is between like partners. And that's what we expect. That's why we rationalized positive deviation. Negative deviation, exactly the opposite. We're going to see the vapor pressure drop below the ideal line. And looking back at how u is defined, it's because we have better interactions between unlike partners. So u is positive and 1, 2 interactions are uh, less favorable than 1, 1 and should say 2, 2 there. And negative when 1, 2 interactions are more favorable than 1, 1 and 2, 2 interactions. And again, it should say 2, 2 there. So I've said that in words, typos on slides, they happen. We'll leave them in for authenticity purposes. So let's go back to that whole excess free energy of mixing. And now I'm going to use this full expression of u1 equals u1 star plus rt log x1 plus u x2 squared. I'm going to take that back outside the logarithm. And when I make a substitution, I'm going to end up with my ideal looking behavior again. And then I have this x1 u x2 squared that comes in from the x1 multiplying this term, x2 multiplying this term, I'll get an x2 u x1 squared. So I get the ideal part for the free energy of mixing, and a u times x1 times x2 times x2 plus x1, so I've just e expanded this if you like. And x2 plus x1, well that's friendly, that's the sum of the two mole fractions, that's 1. So that just becomes u x1 x2. So there you have it, that the entropy of, the excess entropy of mixing is zero. That was the definition of the regular solution. We assumed randomization. The enthalpy of mixing, which then is entirely responsible for the free energy, excess free energy of mixing, is u, x1, x2. It's a pretty simple expression where u has embedded within it all the details of the molecular system. So if u is negative, the free energy of mixing is even more favorable than for an ideal solution. And that makes sense because we said when u is negative, that's better interactions between unlike partners. The opposite is true for u being positive. So let's, let's look a little more at that. What about when u is positive? So let me take that expression. I'll just divide both sides by u just for convenience. And now I'm going to plot this left-hand side, delta mix 
of the molar free energy divided by u for various values of rt over u. So that's this term here. This, always a negative number, right? That's the entropy component from the ideal mixing. This, always a positive number, and it takes on varying values as we go from x1 to x2. And what you find is, if rt over u is greater than 0 0.5, so that's a way of, what is rt over u? So rt is kind of the ambient thermal energy that one experiences at a given temperature. At 298K, it's about 0.6 kcals per mole in those units. So this is saying if the ambient energy exceeds the degree to which the molecules don't like each other that much, by enough, it doesn't even have to exceed it in this case, it only has to be half of it, or, lar so, or larger, so it can get bigger, then you're in a stable region. And by stable, I mean that the, the free energy goes down no matter what I do in terms of adding to the free energy of mixing. All right? it just, it's always good. On the other hand, there is a critical temperature at which when RT over U is equal to 0 0.5, so the bad interaction energies are getting a little bigger. They're starting to be on the order of thermal energy, or at least half. Then you get to this plateau region where over a range of different compositions, there's no additional advantage to mixing. And finally, when RT over U is below 0.5, right? and so the, the bad interactions are getting larger and larger, you get into an unstable region where the benefits of mixing are greater for some compositions than for others. All right? So the excess free energy of mixing here is uh, a good number, but here it's a bad number. So with that equation, we can actually look for the stationary points. That is, if I want to know above this 0.5, where are these minima in free energy of mixing? And also, we, we see that 0.5 is always a maximum once we're in this set of unstable regions. Those two roots, those correspond to the compositions of separated phases at equilibrium. Because those are free energy wells, that's where two phases want to separate out and, and occupy those free energy wells. And so if we really do that calculation for RT over U equals 0 0.4, plug in here and just do the, do the math, you, you find out it's at 14.5% mole fraction and 85.5% on the other side. And in order to build a temperature composition diagram like the one we saw in the last lecture, maybe it was two lectures ago, uh, when we did azeotropes and immiscible uh, mixtures, then you do this for different temperatures, right? RT over U depends on T. So as I raise the temperature, I will increase the ratio of RT over U. I can get it back into stability. I can make those phases come back together again. And as I lower temperature, I can make them separate. So that's how you would construct the phase composition diagram. And so this is uh, just an example of that. Here's RT over U. You get two phases for less than 0 0.5. We just did 0 0.4. You could do all the others as, as one wanted to, simply by plugging in the relevant numbers. And I'll remind you that uh, in 10.7, we actually looked at that for the specific case of phenol and water. So you will see that the, the specifics here, and I'm going to take us back for a second, the specifics here are, they don't look quite the same, right? This is perfectly symmetric. This is a little bit asymmetric. It doesn't peak at 0 0.5. This peaks at 0 0.5. And that's because this model is obviously a little bit crude. Perfect spheres, all the same coordination number. We kind of looked at it in two dimensions. So phenol and water, very different sizes for one thing. Coordination number is probably not the same. One could obviously complicate the theory considerably and, and try to take account of that in order better to match this. But again, mostly I'd like to get this concept together. But really to cement the idea of it's these intermolecular interactions that matter for the way the solutions behave. And that's chemistry, molecular interactions. All right, that is uh, the end. We are pulling into the station on module 10. We will take a look at the high points in a review video, and then we'll be finished.